Welcome to One Plus One, I'm Barry Cassidy. It's hard to find too many positives out of these constant COVID lockdowns, but maybe one of them is that it's made some of us better cooks, or at least more enthusiastic, more regular cooks. The junction points through the day, the meal times have become more of a focus. And I'll be talking about that with Melissa Leong, travel writer, food writer, and of course, one of the judges on MasterChef. This lady travels the world looking for the next big thing in food. One of Australia's hottest food writers and critics, Melissa Leong. <laughs> Melissa Leon, <laughs> welcome to One Plus One. Thank you very much, Barry. We meet in an empty restaurant, which is a sign of the times, but we can at least talk about food. Absolutely. And it really has taken a special place, hasn't it, in the lives of people right at the moment? I think food has been the soothing balm that has helped a lot of people get through this very difficult time. And whether or not it's been cooking or it's been ordering from restaurants to support them and help keep the doors open, you know, metaphorically speaking, um, I definitely feel like food has really come to the fore in terms of not just that um, that physical nourishment, but the emotional nourishment as well. And a lot of people, I'm sure those involved with homeschooling don't have extra hours on the, in, in their day, but some <laughs> people do as a result of, uh, of the lockdowns. Mm. And anecdotally, do you know, know that, that people are actually spending more time preparing meals, perhaps putting more ingredients into their food? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you only need to look to social media to see how, pe how people have become obsessed with certain types of food, whether or not that's baking. I think the great sourdough craze of 2020 was a huge thing. Everybody was baking bread for the first time um, or for the first time in a long time. And um, it's been fun. You know, it, like you said, there's been that extra bit of time to be able to, um, you know, investigate maybe recipes that we've earmarked for later when we have enough. Um, you know, sort of time to spend working on things or, um, you know, just giving something a go just to keep the kids, you know, inspired and interested and uh, involved. And I think MasterChef initially got a lot of a new generation of people interested in cooking in unprecedented ways. And then COVID came along and I think it's had a similar effect in a way. Is, is it that people kind of look at these programs and they think, I've got potential, I might mess a lot up, mm. but they give it a go? I think so. I mean, when it comes to even just the contestants on this last season of, of MasterChef, um, a lot of people lost their jobs or were stood down. Um, and also, I think this COVID time has been a great time of clarification, you know, what is really important to us? Um, what are our dreams and should we put them on hold for any longer? I mean, this is the time to, to really sort of lift the train off the tracks and, and move it, you know, down another course. And um, so I think people are taking greater chances and, and trying the things that they, um, they might have been bookmarking for later. Well, when you were growing up and you were born in, in Sydney, but your parents are from Singapore, yeah. How important was food in your life? Well, I like to say food is our love language. You know, we express care for each other through eating together, through cooking together, through, you know, going out and choosing a restaurant to go to together. And so food has always played such a huge part in my life. Um, you know, my parents being from Singapore, it's a really tiny place and um, and you eat and you shop. And I think those are sort of the two, um, the two great pastimes of Singapore in many ways. And, um, and so my parents definitely translated that love of food to us and we've always loved eating. And then later on, as we got a little bit older, learning how to cook and, and help mum in the kitchen as well. So they obviously brought the, the food culture with them. Is that something that they were jealously guarded that they didn't, <laughs> they really didn't want to adopt whatever it is that Australia has to offer? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think that um, it's just a general love of food, not particular cuisines per se, but I think my parents just really love food in general and, and they certainly were interested in us getting to know, you know, what Australia is like and what all of these, you know, these dishes and these, you know, these meals were that they, they weren't particularly familiar with. And 
Um, my, I think my mum was, you know, very entertained by what we would come home from school and say, oh, you know, so-and-so's mum cooked roast chicken. And she'd be like, okay, well, she'll, and then she would go and look up a recipe in the Australian Women's Weekly or watch Peter Russell Clark or something like that and find a way to um, replicate whatever dish it was that we were describing. And, um, and it was a really wonderful time for her, I think, to discover, you know, new, new dishes and new cuisines. And, um, yeah, my parents are very keen on us getting to know Australia really well. Every summer holiday, we would, you know, get in the car and go on a road trip somewhere new and, and go to some someplace historical or someplace that was really on the map that we, we should know about. And, um, you know, they really embrace being here and they, they have always done. And you mentioned the lunches at school and, and sometimes <laughs> the, the, uh, the lunchbox can tell you a lot yeah. about the person. and. I went to primary school in the late 50s and 60s and it was a time when there were a lot of migrants. And I do recall one of my friends was from Peru mm -hmm. and he was 11 or 12 and he took me aside one day and said, um, how do I fit in? How, what, what should I do to, to fit in more? And I, I, I remember saying to him that um, get rid of the leather shorts and the braces and tell your mother that she cuts your bread way too thick. They would cut it, you know, Really, and th th things like that to just sort of remember that that separated people, and it was it was the it, again it came back to food. Yeah, it's a very interesting concept. You know, what do I do to fit in? And it's something that I you know grapple with because as a kid, any kid in the world wants to fit in with wherever they are, and that comes down to the way that they present themselves, and and I guess a a uniformity of of whatever it is, whether or not that's the, your lunchbox or the way you comb your hair or cut your hair or something like that. Um, and I realise now though that the way I didn't fit in was what has really formed me and who I am today. You know, in, in terms of being okay with um, with being in, being an individual, being able to stand out and stand on my own two feet and be proud of who I am. Um, but it is really funny, you know, the, the, the school lunchbox is, is a very much a shared migrant experience, mm. um, whether or not you are from somewhere else or whether or not you're first generation and born here and your parents um, are feeding you the things that make sense to them. And, you know, I have shared stories of friends who would bring, you know, um, beautiful mortadella, you know, sandwiches to, to school with amazing sort of artichoke salads and things like that. And people go, whoa, what does, what's that smell? And I remember on, on Sundays we would go to Yum Cha and sometimes if we were lucky and there were leftover dumplings, I might bring some to school and people would, um, you know, be fascinated or, um, you know, sometimes repulsed by what was in my lunchbox. And um, I think on some level I was always quite proud of that because it was an opportunity to explain something to people that they didn't understand or know and invite people to try food. And so I think um, from even a very young age, I was always um, really interested in the prospect of enlightening other people in terms of something um, about food that they didn't know and, well, and sharing at a, at a young age, you were doing that? I think so. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm just inherently a bit of a feeder. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, though, that you say that you felt a little different, even that you were born in Sydney. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that that's something that I've been thinking about a lot um, over the last little while, what it is like, um, that migrant experience of being first generation. And, you know, in the home, we're brought up culturally the way that, you know, makes sense to your parents. So wherever your parents come from, they bring with them that wealth of experience, but also they're repeating the multi-generational cultural experience of what they know. And you have that. And then you go to school and you're, we're in school in Australia and there's um, a, a certain way that things are done and certain conversations that are had um, that are part of that, that broader Australian lexicon um, that's not really culturally focused. And so... I feel like there's a schism between that home life and that community life and that socialisation that you have, you know, when you go to school and you become friends with all of the kids in the neighbourhood and all of the rest of it. And um, you tend to, for me, let go of maybe certain parts of your culture in order to, um, as you mentioned before, to fit in. Mm. And that's something that I, as an adult, um, grief for a little bit you know I kind of let go of speaking Cantonese as frequently or um, you know kind of partaking in um, you know in Chinese holidays as much as I used to because as a kid I just wanted to be Australian and to fit in and what it is to be Australian is an ongoing conversation isn't it?
What were your interests in, uh, as you got into high school and got a, a little older? What, what were you good at? Um, well, I was a real doer. There was something on every single afternoon of the um, of the week. So I did everything from um, little athletics to gymnastics, ballet, piano, flute, Kumon mathematics. I did a lot as a kid. Um, I had a very full dance card and I loved it. Um, my parents um, were really focused on giving us every opportunity to explore the things that we um, wanted to explore and, and just to discover things that we might love. I loved um, I loved doing nippers. I loved going for my bronze medallion when I was a kid, you know, learning how to swim in a full, you know, a full armoury of clothes and all of the rest of it. You know, there were so many great things that I enjoy from, you know, from my childhood in that regard. And you're a concert pianist? I played the piano from three and a half years old till I was about 22. And for the greater part of my education, I was gunning towards going to the Conservatorium of Music in Sydney and, and um, I wanted to be a professional pianist concert pianist specifically, and I was naturally very good. Um, my parents had still have no idea where it came from, but I begged at three and a half years old to play the piano, and it didn't stop. So they bought a very cheap um, old secondhand piano and thought, oh, this will this will dissolve in a couple of months time. I was told by my teachers that I was, I was great and I had potential, and um, I continued to play um, for, you know, for that desire to be a concert pianist and um, around the age of, I think about 15 or 16, I started to get injured. So I developed repetitive strain um, injury in my right posterior capsule. So um, it became very difficult to play. I was in constant pain and um, it's something that still affects me today. So. If, if that hadn't, hadn't happened, mm. you think you would have stuck with it? Yeah, I think I would have. Mm. I think I would Is have. Is that what your parents wanted? My parents just wanted me to be happy. They still want me to be happy, whatever that means. So they were quite um, maverick in that regard. There was no, I mean, I'm sure my parents would have loved me to be a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or something like that, something that was safe. Um, ultimately, when it boiled down to it, they just want me to be happy. And I think that that was something that I, I was very grateful for because I have led a very piecemeal life. I've, I've not... Um, had a lot of strategy in terms of you know where I've ended up now and how um, how I've collected what I know along the way, but um, they trusted that I would be okay in the end um, with what I was equipped with. So, so how did you drift into, if that's the right term, drift into into food writing? I think you could say drift. That would be very yeah. fair. Um, well, I finished my my degree in economics and social sciences at Sydney University, and I actually became a, um, a hair and makeup artist for a little while. Um, I was working as a clinic girl as my sort of out of school job when I was when I was at uni, and so I happened to learn. Um, the craft through um, through television and, and movie um, hair and makeup artists who were working, you know, at the clinic counter alongside me for a little while. So I did that because it was fun. A lot of friends were finishing film school at the time. Um, so I, I dived into doing that for a little bit and it was amazingly creative and I'm very grateful for those, those skills, you know, because now in lockdown, at least I can do my own hair and makeup. Um, but I moved into advertising from there and it was at the dawn of social media. It was at a time when, um, you know, we didn't know what a blog was and Twitter was barely being used in Australia. Uh, and um, I think MySpace was around and Facebook certainly hadn't been invented yet. So mm. it was at that very early time in social media where we were still trying to feel it out and we were encouraged, um, you know, in, in our ad agency to um, adopt every platform that we possibly could and, and embed ourselves in a community to really understand how to leverage that conversation for brands. And I chose food because I thought, oh, well, I don't have to spend too much time, you know, kind of researching food because I felt at the time uh, that I knew enough about food that I could kind of fake my way into that space. And as I found myself in that space talking about food, I realised how much I loved talking about food. So you thought and you were faking your way. I thought, it. well, I think I, I think I will always have some small degree of imposter complex, and I know that that's something that a lot of people say. But gen genuinely, I think when when you live a piecemeal existence, you're learning as you're going. So there is that sort of element of, I'll know when I know what I know, if you, if you like. Yeah. So I 
got to know people through food in that way. I learned to to write about food um, in a way that made sense to me. And for me, I never thought of myself as a writer. I always thought of myself as deeply wanting to be understood. And so I focused on learning to communicate effectively. And whether or not that was uh, verbally or if that was in the written context, that has been something that has been a, a, a dominant feature in my life. Yeah, so that's important, isn't it? Because it's one thing to, to know food, yeah. be able to judge food, but you need to communicate it. Absolutely. I guess that's where I was very fortunate because as I got to know people uh, and the community of food, you know, through social media, um, someone noticed my writing and I was an editor from a, a, a street press publication sort of asked me to, um, to start writing for them. And through that process of getting to know people in the industry, I was mentored by some of the greats in food journalism. And um, I continued to learn how to match food knowledge and build food knowledge with the ability to communicate that effectively um, to, to people that wanted to read what I wrote. And how did that lead to MasterChef? How, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a really, really big question. So I was a freelance writer and critic for a while. Um, and then I sort of had a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a trip down um, the PR and marketing route for a little bit. That's where MasterChef comes into it actually, is my very first client was Adriano Zumbo. Um, he was a neighbor of mine. We lived in Balmain, um, had the same circle of friends and MasterChef happened and he didn't quite know what to do with all of this newfound attention. You know, he would have lines going down the street and around the block for macaron and it, you know, it was just ridiculous. And so we worked together for a little while and um, it was the first instance that I understood the impact that this show um, would have on Australia. And that was back in season one. Um, and because of how his career exploded, my career also, you know, continued to be rocketed forward. And so I have MasterChef, um, funnily enough, to, um, to credit for, you know, my, the last sort of decade or more of being in the industry prior Right. to um, to being on MasterChef itself. Can you believe it? This is your last mystery box of the season. 30 minutes down, 45 minutes to go. And just before you, you agreed to, to sign up with MasterChef, you were, I think you were overseas. You were travelling when, when you got the call. Yeah, so I'd done a little bit of television before. I'd, I'd, um, I'd been on SBS and doing The Chef's Line, which was a really amazing kind of grounding for me. And, in terms of marrying my ability to communicate food with my ability to learn the medium of television. And I'll always be grateful for that. And um, I am also really grateful for, you know, being gifted assignments to, to write about food overseas. You know, I've traveled the world to write about food and that privilege is never lost on me. But I was, I had just arrived in Vietnam and there was a whole debacle because there was a typo in, on my visa about when I was born. So it, um, I was queuing and trying to problem solve and all of that kind of thing. And there's a boat waiting for me to to sail uh, down the Mekong to um, to Cambodia. So all the while, while that was all happening, all of that drama of will I make the boat, um, I was receiving messages from um, from Endemol Shine saying, hey, um, so Master Chef, do you want to come and have a chat? And I was like, I, I just don't have time for this. And um, I wasn't sure what they wanted. And, and by the time I had arrived back from Cambodia and Vietnam, about two or three weeks later, I sat down with them and um, we started a conversation and it wasn't as immediate as you would think. I did not say yes right away. So You were not immediately excited about it? it was... I Not that I wasn't excited about being thought of in that regard. I just had seen this tremendous, you know, contribution that MasterChef had made to the Australian, um, you know, food culture and to popular culture in general. And as a journalist, you know, I'm, I'm taught to be sceptical. I'm taught to ask those questions and, and not to just sort of take things at face value. And yes, it's a big shiny opportunity, but it's all, it also comes loaded with expectation and, and uncertainty. And and also loss of privacy as well. And so knowing that those are all potential things that might happen to my life, it really took a long time for me to consolidate um, this wonderful opportunity and this potential dream job with 
how my life might change. And it had been such a successful program too, there'd be some anxiety over that, wouldn't there? That the, Oddly, yeah. that was the only part that, um, that didn't cause me any, any anxiety. And a lot of people said, well, wow, you know, those are huge shoes to fill. And um, I look down at my fabulous shoes and I think, well, these are the only shoes I want to wear. You know, and so there's been very much a, a narrative in my life where I just want to be the best version of myself. I don't believe in emulating other people or trying to be someone else. I just want to be the best version of me that I can bring to every instance. And so I thought, well, I can't be um, these, these wonderful former judges. I can't be any of them, but I can be me. Justin, lovely plate of food. And did you know Jock and Andy before you started out? I had met Jock before I'd interviewed him um, for The Great Australian Cookbook. We put him in that. And so I'd met him very briefly um, many years ago. I can't say we actually got along all that well. He was He's very... Um, focused and, and convicted on in, in what he thinks and what he believes and so am I and so because those two things didn't match I don't think we naturally gelled straight away but years later when we met um, it was you know so much has changed over over the years and we just naturally get along so well and I'm very proud to call him my work husband um, he's a really dear friend and a really you know huge supporter and we are a huge huge support system for each other and I hadn't met Andy before, but I know Andy's business partners in Three Blue Ducks. And um, I knew, and they're wonderful humans, I knew that if they had vouched for him, that um, he was all right. So. That is important, isn't it? <laughs> um, you, you look at the, the teaming up that goes on in breakfast programs, you can have two very talented individuals, mm. but if the rapport's not there, if there's no chemistry, it doesn't work. Chemistry is key, isn't that right? Yep. And um, we feel very lucky. I remember the first time we sat down in a room together to have lunch and everybody kind of like backed away slowly and shut the door. And from the very first instance, there was just a very calm camaraderie. We knew that we were going through this together. Um, and we've always felt very much at ease with each other. So we have a really great dynamic. We have a lot of fun on set and I think yeah. that you can yeah, see I think that. It, there's something you all <laughs> share. Um, you're all quite empathetic towards the contestants. Mm. Is that important to you? I think, for, I mean, be, empathy is, is huge for me. Empathy is everything, isn't it? You know, mm. really um, having a feeling for what someone might be going through is, is the way that we connect as human beings. I value that so much in Jock and Andy as well. Um, we, we each approach it in our own individual way, but it's something that we share and it's something that I think in our chapter um, I would be very proud to be known for. You've spoken in the past about uh, clinical depression, that you've had anxieties. How do you manage that? Uh, it's an ongoing, everyday kind of challenge, isn't it? Um, I grew up with with depression and anxiety, and it's something that I've dealt with um, from um, from being a very small child. And for me, it's it's just part of who I am. But it's also something as an adult that I see. Um, I am required to, for myself, take responsibility for. And I think that when it comes to mental health, it's something that we need to re remove the stigma of. It's just, it's part of being human is to feel the weight of the world sometimes, to feel like you don't fit in sometimes, and to feel a, you know, a myriad of other, other feelings. Um, these are all part of the human experience. And I think the more we talk about it and the more we address it as individuals and as a collective, um, we can move forward and, and really just acknowledge that mental health is something we need to take care of ourselves, but also within each other. So your advice to, to people who are going through this is to have interests, routines, Therapy? Is therapy important? Therapy definitely helped me. That was, um, that was and is something that I, I rely on. I think it's really amazing to be able to have someone in your life that is there just to objectively, you know, give you advice and, and if nothing more, just to listen, unquestionably listen to you. I think that's really, really important. I think that 
when it comes to mental health advice, I'm never going to give it to other people. I can say what worked for me and what continues to work for me, but I think that everybody needs to find their own kind of mix of things that work. You know, I definitely feel like having a support system of, of, um, of friends and family really helps. Um, and, and definitely, you know, going and going and seeking professional help is a great way to sort of show you what the options are and then you can decide for yourself what works. Do you have anxious moments on the set at all? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. There are there are big days where, you know, the hours or, or just the sheer enormity of the production can really um, become quite apparent and there are moments where you kind of just have to take a minute and um, I think the wonderful thing about a production like MasterChef is, is that it is a family so you can be very honest with the people around you to say, I just need a minute and just go and take a minute for yourself. And I find that breathing and meditation definitely helps to kind of ground you and, and get you back in the moment. You said you regard yourself as a private person, but you're very much now a public figure. <laughs> How do, you, how do you square that circle? Um, with a fair amount of effort, I feel. I, I, I am someone that I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be someone who people think of as being open and being empathetic and being a, being a sharing kind of person because that is genuinely who I am. But I do feel like there needs to be a line where you leave some things for yourself um, out of the equation and they're just for you and the, the people closest to you. Um, but the shared human experience of going through things like anxiety and depression or not knowing what you want to do when you grow up or, you know, um, what it's like to be a first generation, you know, migrant in Australia, what that experience is. These are all shared experiences that I love to be able to talk about. I love to um, be part of that conversation, perhaps make people feel a little less alone in what they're going through. Mm. Um, but you have to leave a few little, few things aside for yourself, I think. Yeah, and, and the recognition anyway is sort of validation in a way, isn't it? it it's, it's saying that whatever you're doing must be working, which is that's successful. Right. That's right. I think that's a really good way to think about it because I've uh, inevitably in the last two years, people have said things like, oh, how does it feel to be famous? Or now that you're a celebrity and I shudder at that, uh, you know, the word famous or the word celebrity in connection to my name because I don't see myself like that. I see myself as being incredibly lucky to, to live my dream job. And the way I consolidate it is that um, pe being known is a function of doing your job successfully. It well, certainly is in my case. And so it's with gratitude that I meet the notion of that now. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining One Plus One. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.